Welcome to the Road to Jesus with Pastor Fred here at St. James Lutheran Church in Marion, Indiana. Today we're covering Joshua chapter 2 through Judges chapter 2. Actually, we're just going to be covering basically the entire book of Joshua, at least in part. So I think you'll find this to be an interesting um, story um, as you read along. First story we run into in Joshua is about Rahab, the prostitute, and she's the prostitute who hides the spies. She has heard about the nation of Israel and their crossing of the Red Sea and how they had defeated the kings of Shihon and Og, and she has somehow become a believer in the Israelite God. And she promises to hide the spies if they will save her and her family when they take over Jericho. And the spies agree, and she makes sure they get hidden and that they eventually get away. Um, but they give her, as part of this deal, a scarlet thread to hang out of her window and tell her that her and her family must stay inside the house during the invasion. Now, when we hear about the red thread in the window and staying inside during the destruction, it of course reminds us of the Passover and the death of the firstborn in Egypt in the book of Exodus, and how the people put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, and the angel of death passed over their house and saved the people inside. It also points us, of course, to Jesus on the cross as his blood washed away our sins and saved us. Rahab, we find out later in the New Testament, becomes an ancestor of Jesus. Jesus, in other words, is one of her descendants. In chapter 3, Israel finally crosses the Jordan. Now, it says the second, the minute, the second that the priest's feet touched the water, it parted, and it rose in a heap during what was considered flood stage, and the people passed through on dry ground. A reminder again of the Red Sea and, of course, baptism. The Jordan River is later where John the Baptist does his baptizing and where he also um, baptizes Jesus. In chapter 5, God commands that Moses circumcise all the children that had been wandering around the desert for 40 years. Remember, God had said everyone over the age of 20 will die off, and so these people range in age from 1 years old to, quite frankly, close to probably 60 years old. The fact they hadn't been circumcised shows how sinful, and the, sinful the generation had been that had rebelled against God and refused to enter the promised land. They hadn't even circumcised their own children, signifying the covenant they had with God. It also is in this chapter that the people celebrate the first Passover in the new promised land. Well, as they're getting ready for battle against Jericho, Joshua runs into a warrior who turns out to be an angel and a commander of the Lord's army. In other words, the pre-incarnate Jesus. Remember, the angel of the Lord, always pre-incarnate Jesus. Jesus without flesh on. And Joshua approaches this warrior angel and asks whose side he is on. And the commander of the Lord's army says, wrong question, buddy. The question is not on whose side is God. The question is, who is on God's side? A question that is still relevant today in war and in any type of conflict and situation. Who's on God's side, not whose side is on God. In chapter 6, God tells the Israelites to take Jericho by walking around it one time for six days, blowing trumpets, and then on the seventh day they are to walk around it seven times. And at the end of the seventh time around, the trumpet is to sound a blast, and the people are to shout, and the walls of the city will fall, and the people will go in. So we've got that seven times thing going on there, number of God. God said, do not take anything out of that city but the silver and gold for the treasury. Destroy all the devoted things. Well, after everything is said and done, Joshua makes an oath that no one would be able to rebuild Jericho, and if they did, it would be at the cost of the person's firstborn son. Interestingly enough, in 1 Kings chapter 16, during the reign of King Ahab, a man by the name of Hale of Bethel did rebuild Jericho, and it was at the cost of his firstborn son. In Joshua chapter 7, just as things are getting going, well, Israel gets defeated by Ai, a battle they did not expect to lose. And the reason for this is Achan, an Israelite, had taken some of the devoted things from Jericho, which, he, which they were forbidden to do, and he had hidden them for his own benefit. Now God was punishing the nation of Israel for this, even though no one knew he had done it. After the battle, it comes out, and God orders that Achan be killed. And so the Israelites kill him, and God removes the curse from him. 
God takes his word and his commands and his promises seriously. In Joshua chapter 9, we run into the Gibbonites. Now, they were a tribe that lived in the promised land. And remember what God had told the Israelites about tribes living in the promised land. He said, destroy them completely. Do not make treaties with them. Wipe them out utterly. Leave no survivors. Kill everything that breathes. Well, the Gibbonites had seen what had happened to Jericho and I, and they have seemed to have kind of figured this out. And so they tricked the Israelites into thinking they are a nation that lives outside the promised land, that, you know, they live in a land far, far away. And so they go to see Joshua dressed in old clothes, carrying old wineskins, and making it seem like they've traveled a long way. Joshua and the leaders fall for it, and they make a treaty with them that they will support one another, that they will be allies. When Joshua and the others find out the truth, they confront the Gibbonites, but they don't attack them because they made this treaty with them. So they reduce them to be their slaves and let them live in the promised land with them. Well, chapter 7, we find out word spreads fast, and a bunch of other kings are very alarmed by this treaty between Israelite and the Gibbonites. They know Israel is powerful, and the Gibeon is a pretty large nation. And so these five kings get together and decide to attack Gibeon first. Well, the Gibeonites call up Joshua and say, Hey, remember that treaty we had of us being allies? Well, we need your help. We've got five king's armies headed right for us. Joshua's like, Seriously? Five? Really? But God tells Joshua, Don't worry. I've got this. You will win this war. So Joshua heads to war. God puts the foreign armies into a panic and then literally hurls large rocks from heaven, killing them in mass. I mean, when God starts throwing rocks at and hailstones at you from heaven, you're pretty much toast. Well, Joshua sees this and begins to pray that the sun will stand still so they'll have more light to kill even more of the enemy. And God answers Joshua's prayer, and the sun literally stands still, giving them more time to destroy these five kings. Well, in the midst of this, they capture these five kings, they put them in a cave, and they roll a stone in front of it. When everything is said and done, they bring these five kings out, and Joshua has his army chiefs put their boots on these guys' necks, and then he kills all five of them. And like with the king of Ai, he hung their dead bodies on trees to shame them in front of everyone, which also meant they were cursed by God, which was true because it was God who pretty much um, won the battle that day. The chapter continues with Joshua then taking his army and capturing the southern kingdom, and wiping out all those nations to a man and killing their kings, one right after another. Chapter 11 is basically a repeat of chapter 10, except this time it's the northern kingdoms that he wipes out instead. In chapter 13, you would think by this time, with all these battles, with all these victories, with all these dead kings, that they would have eliminated everyone and all the nations would be gone, and they would be alone in the promised land. But it's quite the opposite. Yes, they'd taken out a lot of them, but there were still many groups and people remaining that needed defeated and thrown out. This had all taken some time, too, because it says in chapter 13 that Joshua is now old. We also see the allotment of the land for the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, which were east of the Jordan on the other side. Remember, In chapter 14, we start to get into the detailed inheritances for the various tribes, and this can be some tedious reading, but once we get out of this, hey, we got clear sailing. But these chapters are important. Don't skip over them. We see, first of all, that Caleb steps up and requests his inheritance. Now remember, along with Joshua, Caleb was one of the two spies that gave a favorable report about the promised land. So he and Joshua are the old guys in the nation. And he had been promised a special inheritance, and Joshua gives him what he asked for. In chapter 15, Judah gets listed first which points us to the fact that Judah is going to be a very important tribe, the one that the Messiah, Jesus, will come from. A little note at the end of this chapter, though, mentions the Jebusites, which was a tribe that Judah could not seem to drive out. In fact, they would not be completely driven out for another 400 years when David drives them out and captures Jerusalem. In chapter 16, we run to tribes of Ephraim and the other half-tribe of Manasseh. Now these, remember, Ephraim and Manasseh were children of Joseph that Israel had claimed as his own. 
It also notes that they had not completely driven the Canaanites out of their land. In chapter 17, this allotment of Manasseh continues, and it said over and over again that Ephraim and Manasseh are children of Joseph. The point is, Manasseh and Ephraim are treated as one tribe representing Israel's son Joseph, but they each get their own allotment. So two allotments. Chapter 18, we see, start to see the allotment of the rest of the land. Joshua tells the rest of the tribes to send out three men each to map the territory, and Joshua will draw lots to see who gets what. The first one up is Benjamin. Then there's Simeon. And they actually take some of Judah's land for Simeon, because Judah had too much land for the number of people it had. Zebulun's next, then Issachar, then Asher, then Apatilia, then Dan. And then Joshua, remember he's the second spy with Caleb and the leader, he claims his own special land as one of the good spies. Well, chapter 22, it's all said and done, and now the eastern tribes, whose land is on the other side of the border, can return home. Remember, they had been given their land by Moses with the promise that they would cross over and aid the other tribes in defeating the people in the promised land. So they go back home. But on the way back home, they build an altar on their side of the Jordan. The other tribes see it, and they think they're setting up an alternative place of worship, which God had forbidden. So they raise an army to go attack the eastern tribes. As they're getting ready to attack the eastern tribes, they have explained to them that this is not an alternative place of worship um, or an alternative altar. It had been built for the children to see that they belonged to the nation of Israel. And the rest of the nation of Israel never forgot, just because they live on the other side of the Jordan, that they are all still family. The nation of Israel realizes is this okay, and they all go home. In chapter 24, we see the covenant renewed yet again. Again, 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 he renews this covenant. And we hear Joshua's famous, Choose this day whom you will serve speech. It says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It all ends with Joshua's death. And strangely enough, the mention that Joseph's bones from some 400 years before had been brought into the promised land to be buried on his son's inheritance. So, Next week, we will cover Judges 3 through Judges 21, which is basically the entire book of Judges. And I think that you will find that reading fascinating. If you enjoyed the book of Joshua, you will really enjoy the book of Judges. So thank you for joining us for The Road to Jesus with Pastor Fred here at St. James Lutheran Church in Marion, Indiana. And we will see you next week. Peace out.